and we are going to record this session. Um, it's part of our um, it's part of our series, which I'll talk about. Um, my name is Beth Rubenstein. I know many of you, and I haven't met many of you, and we just met a new staff person. So we actually have a lot of new public works staff um, showing up today for the first time to an inspecting our foundation. So welcome to you. Happy New Year to everyone. Really excited to um, kick off our um, Jan uh, our series for inspecting our foundation um, program. Um, so I'm Beth Rubenstein and I'm in our policy and communications team and I'm also the lead of our racial equity um, working group, our initiative. There's, we have a group of 10 of us plus two absolutely new staff people that I wanna introduce and um, Clint, maybe we can um, uh, pin them. I'd love to introduce uh, Yuvia Hernandez and McLeet Billiard, who are our new ra racial equity team who are working at 49 South Van Ness and also at operations. Do you see McLeet too? Um, and just wanted to get them to say a quick, a quick hello to everyone so you recognize their faces. Um, and many thanks in advance to Clint Otwell, who's our Zoom helper and administrator. There they are. Um, just want to ask them, like super happy that they're on board, that in the, they're in their second month at Public Works. Um, Yuvia, uh, what's been the most um, exciting thing that you've noticed at Public Works in the last two months? What's, what have you enjoyed? Hi, everyone. Super excited to be here. My name is Yuvia Hernandez, racial equity specialist. Like Beth mentioned, it's been about two months since I started. And um, I've just really enjoyed meeting a lot of people throughout the last two months. But I think most of all, it's been the learning spaces that I've been able to join, just like this one today. I really just appreciate those kinds of opportunities. Thank you. And McLeet, uh, what have you enjoyed so far at Public Works? Hi, everyone. My name is McLeet Billiard. I use she, her pronouns. I'm the other new racial equity specialist. Um, I've also enjoyed all the learning opportunities. I think what's been like my favorite thing is how well received our work is throughout the department. I don't feel like, you know, I'm actively fighting anyone, which is lovely. And it's really nice and affirming to know that this department does care about racial equity. And then I also want to shout out our staff over our operations. Um, I encourage everyone in this room to go down there one day, have conversations with the people who work there. It's really life giving. It fills my heart with joy to speak to the people out there. Um, yeah. That's what I've enjoyed. Thank you two so much. So inspecting our foundations, um, uh, maybe we can stop the pinning for a second. Um, so I think at this point, you all know inspecting our foundations as part of our racial equity initiative, we, um, we commissioned in-house a whole history of public works through a racial equity lens. And I want to give a shout out to um, Ben Peterson on our communications team, who was the main researcher and um, and writer for Inspecting Our Foundation. And then also to his collaborator, Julian Pham, who's also in the communications um, team, who designed this incredible interactive um, interactive uh, website. And we'll put the, if you haven't looked at it, I really encourage you all to look at it. We'll put the uh, link in the chat. So starting a year ago, kind of can't believe we're in 2024, we initiated a series of kind of lunch and learn programmings, um, generally once a month that took a chapter of inspecting our foundation um, about that history through a racial equity lens and tried to unpack it a little bit more. And we had everything from a discussion of indigenous lands and sort of point of view to looking at redlining and looking at redevelopment in uh, the Western Edition to the destruction of the I Hotel. And we're super excited to kick off 2024 with a discussion of um, environmental justice. So um, I am going to pass it off to Yuvia, who's going to introduce our incredible speakers. I do want to welcome the panelists and thank them for being here today. I'm not sure if we can highlight them, Clint, but we have brought three amazing panelists today to share their knowledge and expertise around what this work looks like and what environmental justice really means and the importance of EJ. We have Danielle No with us today. She is a senior planner at the San Francisco Planning Department. Danielle focuses on resilience and sustainability and is co-author of the citywide 
General Plan's Environmental Justice Framework. Danielle will speak on the role of the city. The city plays an important role around how it sets policy, what's allowable, how to do things, what's not allowable, what you need to consider, and maybe projects it funds. Thank you, Danielle, for being here today. Our next panelist is our very own John Sway. John is the manager of contracts, grants, and initiatives for DPW's Bureau of Urban Forestry. Recently, he helped manage the creation of the city's new street tree nursery and secured a 12 million federal grant to plant thousands of trees in the city's underserved communities. John will speak on the role of the department, the role of public works around how we can bring that environmental lens to our work and how urban forestry plays a role through tree canopy inequity and much more. Thanks, John, for being here today. And last but certainly not least, Tiffany Ng joining us today. Tiffany is a Civic Engagement Director at the Chinese Progressive Association here in San Francisco, also known as CPA. She organizes alongside low-income and working-class immigrant Chinese communities to improve working and living conditions. Her passion for environmental justice led her to grow and manage sisterhood gardens. Tiffany will speak on the role and importance of community, community groups, people and their role as stewards of the land and how that is showcased through urban farming, planting food and communities coming together on public works land. Thank you all for being here today. I myself am new to learning about environmental justice. So I'm super excited to hear about what you all will be sharing with us today. And before we begin, I'll break down a little bit of our time. Everyone will have seven to eight minutes to showcase their presentation, and then we'll go and uh, move to some Q&A at the end. So please write down your questions. And that's all from me. So Danielle, you have the floor. Great. Thanks, everyone. Thanks, Beth, Yuvia, and Clint for having me. Um, I am just on the 14th floor, so <laughs> feel free to reach out afterwards if you'd like to chat. Um, it's really great to be here today with John and Tiffany. Um, my colleague and principal planner at SF Planning, Lisa Chen, is also in the room. And so while I'm speaking today, it really took a whole village to do this. And so I will start sharing my screen to talk to you about the environmental justice framework. All right, so the environmental justice framework is a large component of the city's general plan. And so I know that, um, you know, at SF Planning, we talk about it all the time, but <laughs> let's give a little bit of background for everyone in the audience today. So the city's general plan is stewarded by SF Planning and it's a citywide document. It's mandated by state law and includes a whole host of policies that have at least a 20 year perspective. And so through a public adoptions process, it reflects community values and priorities um, that affect all city departments as well as many other agencies in the city. It has about 10 different chapters or called elements that really pertain to so much of how we live, work and play. And over the past few years, the department has been going some major um, efforts to update these components. You've probably heard of the housing element that was recently adopted in 2023. And I'm here to talk to you about the environmental justice framework that's brand new, it's considered the first effort to incorporate racial and social equity as well as environmental justice into the general plan. And so this work responded to SB 1000 that required municipalities like us to analyze data on disadvantaged communities. We relabeled the disadvantaged communities as environmental justice communities, so you'll hear me use that terminology throughout the rest of the presentation. The EJ communities are presented in a map that I'll share with you later on, and that designates areas where policies and projects should, should prioritize action. And then also SB 1000 requires us to adopt general plan policies so that we address the unique or compounded health risks of EJ. 
And lastly, at the local level, there's been resolutions by our Planning Commission and Historic Preservation Commission so that there are general plan policies with unique benefit for the American Indian community, the Black community, and other communities of color. So at the state and local level, there's been a big thrust to do this work. Uh, this work is rooted in environmental racism and environmental racism recognizes that the American Indian community, black community, and other communities of color have borne the brunt of environmental hazards and denied access to communities of opportunity due to systemic and institutional racism. And in response to environmental racism, their communities have led the movement for environmental justice for many, many decades. And recently, there's been state and federal law that have codified a definition for environmental justice. And so on the screen, you can see that the state and federal definition is about fair treatment of people of all races, cultures, and incomes with respect to the development, adoption, implementation, and enforcement of environmental laws, regulations, and policies. From this state definition, we brought it just a step down to the local definition. And it's put in the environmental justice framework and is used as a citywide definition for EJ. Um, it's similar and went through some community outreach and lots of discussion. And I'd like to highlight the second sentence, which states that government should foster environmental justice through processes that amend, mitigate, Oh, and address past injustices while enabling community-led solutions for the future. And so with that grounding, I wanted to now get into the project. And I would say the process of creating the environmental justice was just, the, the framework was just as important as the outcome. So through our work, we aimed to meaningfully involve the community in the local decision-making process for the framework. And that includes the residents, the workers, the community leaders who are most impacted by EJ. We also aim to elevate it to a citywide dialogue across neighborhood boundaries and along the way, acknowledge past harms of EJ and identify solutions where the city can step in. Um, on the right hand side, you can see some screenshots and unfortunately all of our outreach was virtual because of 2020 and 2021. But John Sway was in our EJ framework, just not in the uh, Brady Bunch tiles. And um, not Tiffany, but Chinese Progressive Association was represented by Maggie Dong. So I really like how this panel was assembled. All right, so over the two years we did so many activities under the sun and we were really trying to pull out these common themes of the outreach to put into these citywide policies. Notably, we had an EJ working group that brought together city staff and communities together in the same virtual room. And we're really proud that we reached unanimous consensus over a whole slew of policy recommendations that informed the development of our framework. We did publish the policy recommendations, I would say like raw or uncut on our website. And you could see a lot of rich detail from our outreach that I would say all city agencies could, could benefit from. And so we're proud of the relationships we built um, with all the community-based organizations. Um, so many students, residents, leaders, what have you, shared a lot of frank and honest commentary about their living experiences in the city. And certainly um, we're grateful for their trust in us to interpret that, incorporate that into the framework. And so moving on to the environmental justice communities map, wanted to share with you our methodology for highlighting the geographic areas of the city that are experiencing EJ and need prioritized attention. So SB 1000 provided us with some guidance of how to spatially analyze EJ communities. Um, on the left hand side, you can see Cal Enviroscreen, which is a state map that designates allocation of cap and trade funding, the greenhouse gas reduction fund. Um, from there, we added additional data layers on the right hand side that provide a more higher resolution understanding of San Francisco. 
And so we included household income. We included the air pollution exposure zone. And lastly, the areas of vulnerability analysis that importantly has additional social and economic indicators like race, ethnicity, and linguistic ability. And, um, you know, we ran it through GIS. And our final map is now on the screen. This is our published environmental justice communities map. And you can see the areas in red are deemed EJ communities. These areas are the top one third of census tracts that have this environmental and social burden. And they are often low, in commu low income communities and communities of color. All the policies in the framework are prioritizing these areas in red. And compared to Cal Screen, which I can gently switch back and forth, you can see that our map is a bit more expansive, a bit more inclusive of what is um, at the state level, Treasure Island, uh, Soma, parts of the mission, and the Bayview. And we're really just trying to highlight and ground truth these areas that are experiencing disproportionate burden. And so with this map, we really encourage all city departments like yourself to use it um, as a base for decision making, um, as well as use it flexibly for what pertains the most to public works activities. Um, as an example, you could use a you can use a buffer if you wanted to a spatial buffer, or you can use it in tandem with other maps or criteria. And so we're excited to share that there are partner agencies who are already using the map. Um, there's some that are listed below. As an example, the PUC has used it as eligibility criteria for receiving green infrastructure grant funding. And Rec and Park, their commission recently adopted it as part of their latest equity zones. So for the final uh, show, the framework itself does include policies that address the topics you can see on the screen. SB 1000 has really encouraged it encouraged us to think expansively about EJ. Um, definitely it's rooted in healthy and resilient environments and reducing exposure to pollution. And also it's a lot of other indicators for healthy communities, green jobs, healthy food access, um, affordable housing, what have you. And so I wanted to share an excerpt of the EJ framework. I know this is not legible, but kind of just wanted to visually walk you through what it looks like if you dig into the framework. After some context setting that really depict, that really illustrates EJ in San Francisco, um, on the left-hand side, there's a little bit of why it matters, some local context. Then there's a vision statement for that aspirational end state of each topic before finally going into the priority and strategy language that really guides all of our action. And on the right hand side, um, there's some example strategies of previous and ongoing work to celebrate of how all of our agencies, community based organizations, collaboratives are working bit by bit, bit, bit by bit towards EJ. And so just due to time, I'm just going to highlight a sum, uh, some of these topics, not all of them. And so as an example, for healthy and resilient environments, there's policy language around nature-based solutions, green infrastructure, and urban greening. And then there's also um, policies about investing in resilient utility systems to affirm the human right to water, power, and sanitation. Um, another example is physical activity and healthy public facilities. And there's policies about um, supporting a robust transportation network, as well as not just the facilities themselves, but the programs that really encourage folks from all cultures to participate. Um, and the last example is equitable in green jobs. And there's policies about living wages for all, as well as a network for work and entrepreneurship. 
So just to wrap up for the EJ framework, it, it was adopted last um, January 2023, so almost one year anniversary. And our department is thinking through incorporating this framework throughout the remainder of the general plan and a lot of other internal processes. And we've had conversations like this that have been a little ad hoc, opportunistic about coordination of all of our uh, departments. We're happy to think through uh, your work programs, tying it to your respective RSC plans, as well as you know, really getting it into implementation, grants, projects, legislation. Please, we're really open door and happy to chat about it. Um, so really uh, excited to share this with you as a resource to, to all of you. And now I'll just pass it to John so that we can see what it could look like. Thanks, thank Sarah. you thank you so much danielle that's fabulous P please put your questions in the chat and we'll have q a after the three presentations okay are we looking good you see the screen looks good okay great well it's it's uh it's really great to follow danielle because i did spend prior to coming to public works i spent 11 years at the planning department and as a recovering urban planner, just a warning, you will see a lot of maps in my presentation as well. So as Danielle talked about at the higher level, setting policy for the city around environmental justice, I'm gonna talk a little bit more how we um, operationalize that at the city level, through a programmatic level in our urban forestry work, and also at a project-based or neighborhood level through our recent street tree nursery budget. So at a city-wide level, you know, we can look at um, you know, the environment from uh, the perspective of how uh, green infrastructure, particularly urban forestry, in my case, you know, interacts with our city and our communities. And here you can see Sunset Boulevard and the resource of tree canopy in this neighborhood, as well as some of the backyards. But when we look at the city overall, we compare neighborhoods to neighborhoods, we can see that there is generally a larger unequal distribution of trees. In this case, this map is showing urban tree canopy by neighborhood. And we can see the darker green areas have much more trees and tree canopy than the other neighborhoods, uh, the lighter neighborhoods. In particular, this means there's an unequal distribution of access to trees, but also their benefits. So include air quality, some of the environmental justice things that Danielle was talking about, you know, carbon storage, providing access to nature, and the physical and mental health benefits that nature provides us, as well as uh, shade during increasing numbers of heat waves and hot days we're experiencing. And you can see on the right is the list of the neighborhoods. And, you know, I'll we'll talk more about this, but particularly some of the neighborhoods with the biggest um, discrepancy are on um, South of Lincoln, where it has one of the smallest troop penalties in the San Francisco. And I think this is obvious to all of us as we move about the city. We can see that neighborhoods look different and they have particularly different access to nature. So there's a street view of um, a street in St. Francis Wood compared to the Tenderloin. So tree canopy, you know. Looking back at the map, this is what it you know, feels like on the ground. And these places feel like very different places. And you know, there's complex reasons for that, and they're very different urban forms. But we can see that there's a there's a disproportionate access to trees in, in these two works. And this was an analysis done by the SF Chronicle a couple of years back that looked at tree canopy in San Francisco and household income by census tract, and they showed a direct correlation that. Neighborhoods that have higher incomes have higher trees. And so I think this is you know, general, um, you know, this is a historic realm of kind of investment and disinvestment in particular communities in San Francisco that we're trying to address. And so here we're looking at these inequality, inequalities in a little more detail, including climate risks. And so the map on the left shows tree canopy percentage as well as disadvantaged census tracts. And so these are disadvantaged census tracts as identified by the state. And um, in terms of tree canopy, the city's uh, disadvantaged census tracts have about 50% as much tree canopy as the non-disadvantaged census tracts. This is a clear uh, disproportion of not there. And then in terms of extreme heat vulnerability, the disadvantaged census tracts are about you know almost half as more likely to be subject to extreme heat than the non-disadvantaged census calls. So the work we're doing is in, in our racial equity focus is really trying to put some of the, the least wall off first. 
And at the neighborhood level, I mean, this is a clear example of an environmental justice community. And this was also identified on Daniel's map, but this is the south of market. And you can see uh, this neighborhood you know, is lacking trees in the space, but also has a high exposure to pollution. And so if we zero in at the neighborhood level, we want this up in market, but this, you know, this was a long time industrial area that's been transitioning over time to housing, new office development, and has been a center of night in the city for a long time. But it also, in terms of environmental justice, is a big focus of our regional transportation system, the freeway, on the access to the bay, on and off the bay bridge, which is you know, why it is an environmental justice component, largely because of the air pollution, freeway traffic, noise, lack of green space that that neighborhood experiences, along with the, the small street and the density share. And then some of the vulnerable communities that are in that neighborhood with a significant low income population and unhoused population. And there's other maps, the one Daniel just shared on the left that shows the EJ communities with Soma being there, and a the map on the right that was moved by Ava Ross in the Landscape Architecture Division that looked at um, census tracts that have a high, that are both the highest extreme for experience of heat and air pollution. We can see that the South Market you know, ranks highest in it. I think when we see these maps, you know, how do we use them and how do we kind of initiate projects that will uh, create change in these neighborhoods. And so looking at our location for our new street tree nursery, uh, you know, we're looking at different sites throughout the city, and this one kind of came up in the south of market. And at first, you know, it didn't, at first glance, it wouldn't seem like the ideal place to put a nursery, but the more that we looked at it, the more we looked at some of the data we were just sharing about the importance of, you know, transforming spaces into green air community assets, it became the perfect space to actually design a street tree nursery, but not put out its challenges. So part of the larger vision for the South of Market that the planning department's been working on, but I know our landscape architects are working on too, is, you know, how can we really transform these EJ, uh, this EJ infrastructure, large freeways, carbon emissions, uh, pollution into something that is, uh, you know, pollution absorbing, carbon absorbing, provides recreation and wind spills. And so we're starting to think of all these parcels along the freeway spine and the south of market as the potential for a larger network of open space, trees, and uh, the nursery is hopefully just the first piece of this larger network. And I think Jennifer Cooper from Last Week Architecture just uh, submitted a, a big grant application at Caltrans that allows us to do further planning in this area. So our street tree nursery, why are we building a street tree nursery? Well, we need, need, we need space. We want to address that inequity in tree canopy throughout the city. So we plan to really boost our tree planting and street tree planting in particular throughout San Francisco. So we need a place that we can store, sage these trees for the plantings that are going to be taking place. And then it's a nursery. So we definitely want to grow our own trees. And we'd like to grow trees that are acclimated to our climate. You know, a lot of trees that we buy are purchased, they're grown in much hotter climates. Um, and sometimes when they come to San Francisco, they're not actually as accustomed to our weather here. So we'll be growing trees that we think will product better. Uh, we also want to reduce the impacts of just you know, tree delivery on um, environmental work. And then a big part of our component is the jobs, workforce development, and educational opportunities that this nursery will provide. And Ross Pearson, who is our new volunteer outreach coordinator, who is now working out of the nursery and with a lot of creative ideas about how we can engage uh, people in this project. So here's just a couple shots. This was uh, a photo taken before we started uh, playing with the work. And then over time, we've been transforming this over the past year into a nursery. And that's our, our first buildings, and our, our solar system. And then right before our opening, our ribbon cutting actually back in November, this was a, a, a shot that the governor's office took. And I think what I would say is, you know, what we're trying to do here is grow up to a thousand trees and, you know, there's so many different pieces to talk about of this project, but I think one of the things I'm also proud of when we talk about justice and environmental justice, we're thinking about climate justice. And we like to say the nursery is, is flower power because like plants, we're using our energy from the sun. So our nursery is actually 100% off grid. We're not connected to PG only. We're actually a net generator of electricity. We're currently generating more electricity than we use through our, our solar system. And you know, we really thought of that. And here uh, was the site, and here's the site on the ground, and eventually this will be filled with like many more trees. Here's just a couple shots of the construction. 
the process. And then uh, in terms of justice, I really want to give a shout out to the planning department again. This is, um, we were lucky to work with Gary Chen, who's a very talented graphic designer at the planning department. We developed this logo, Melissa Wong, also from the planning department. And this really encapsulates our vision around the nursery for justice, jobs, climate, and trees. And since we're talking primarily about the justice piece today, I just wanted to you know, recap these main elements. So part of environmental justice and the justice components are that we're citing the nursery in the that's at least that's least lacking in trees and green space. Uh, that we're growing trees to be planted in neighborhoods with the smallest tree canopy and highest heat exposure. And then we're redistributing resources by prioritizing the communities that are at least well off and um, creating jobs and workforce development opportunities for low wealth communities, and then reducing environmental burdens of free way and creating and then um, and then the community. So, you know, the cool thing was we got a lot of attention during our opening, you know, the mayor was there, the governor was there, this logo actually made it on Fox News and a bunch of other news outlets um, during that time. We had uh, a successful ribbon cutting event. Here's uh, a group of us, including the head of the Association of Rama Tishaloni, where the indigenous representatives of San Francisco, uh, planting a coastline oak tree. This, this is one of two. And these are native trees native to San Francisco. And to our knowledge, there aren't very many in the South Atlantic. So this is an exciting moment. And then our landscape architects, um, a uh, construction manager really you, along with the construction company, created this really beautiful space that we hope you can all come to and participate in. And the space is beautiful, but what's even more beautiful are the beautiful people that are in it. And so here's a couple of photos of some of the people that have helped us build it and celebrate it. And the last thing I just want to talk about please, is jobs, because this is a part of uh, the justice component. So American Forest is a national uh, forestry organization, and they estimate that there's about 150,000 plus tree care jobs that will need to be filled in the next couple of years. And the annual wage for entry level tree care jobs is higher than starting wages for a lot of other jobs. And there's a lot of opportunities for employment with public agencies, nonprofits, and private contractors. So we really want to make this uh, workforce development component of the work that we're doing there. And we did receive a $1 million Cal Fire grant for workforce development. And we are working with Friends of the Urban Forest, which is a nonprofit in San Francisco, to create a workforce development program there that they're calling New Roots. So this will allow us to train 20 participants over two and a half years in nursery operations, tree growing, and tree care. And then we'll work to help place them in jobs and provide job training for them as well. And this is Nate, uh, one of our first New Roots participants. And on the right, um, Daniel and Allegra from our Urban Forestry Inspection Team. They're helping bring them a new batch, first batch of trees. And I, this photo, I just, uh, I was kind of shocked when I saw this and excited because this is me, our first workforce development assistant who was actually shaking hands with Governor Newsom. And you know, what this symbolizes for me is that we have the possibility to break down uh, boundaries of power and create opportunity. And so I'm really excited about, you know, what we can do moving forward. And I think our ambitions could even go broader. Uh, you know, this nursery space, I think, will become much more than a nursery. We're already seeing that. This is Zach and Omar, who uh, were our chefs recently for a uh, buff appreciation, staff appreciation event for everyone who helped build the nursery. And being there, they just got really excited. And Omar was asking if there's a way we can come back and, you know, create uh, to cook. And maybe there's a way that we could cook for some of the on-house population of the nursery. And I think I'm really open to different creative ideas about how this place could be real valuable. So I think I'll stop there. I'll pass it to Tiffany. Thank you so much, John. Thanks, John. Um, that was very inspiring. I love that. Learned a lot about workforce development. Um, my organization, the Chinese Press Association, is a worker center. We work with a lot of low wage workers, immigrant workers who hope to, in the future, you know, have higher wage jobs, right? Um, have jobs that are 
sustainable where they're not facing exploitation. So yeah, workforce development, very important. Uh, um, let me let's share my screen. Can you give me access permission? Just gave you access. Uh, we saw it for a second and then it left. Yes. Okay. Okay. Do you see it now? Yes. Yes. That looks good. Great. Thank you all. Um, great. I'm so excited to speak with you all at Public Works um, and talk about uh, Sister Gardens. So again, uh, I think you already went through my bio, but um, so I'm not gonna go through it. Here's uh, some pictures. I, um, uh, so CPA is a community organizing uh, uh, nonprofit. We have a membership base and we really emphasize the need to build, build up people power and community led solutions. And so I myself am, um, came from uh, CPA's membership. I was I joined when I was 15, and that was when I learned a lot about environmental justice. And I grew up in the Excelsior, which is part of the Southeast, which is part of the higher impacted um, neighborhoods, right? Where we have freeways, you know, air pollution, um, a lot of industrial legacy there. Um, so um, most of my most of my time at CPA, I'm working on getting people to be civically engaged, get out the vote. Um, but I have in the past few years had the pleasure of helping um, steward Sister Gardens. So I uh, wanted to share that, yeah, Sister Gardens is a product of community organizing. It is a community victory. Um, and it also came from really strong partnership between city uh, public agencies like public works right so sister gardens is on public works land at brotherhood way i don't know a lot of people say they drive by to go to work um uh, and brotherhood way is often um highly traffic highly trafficked right um sometimes a dangerous cor corridor um but along it there is a lot of green space with a lot of potential to um and it is used already as recreation. There's like a dog park. Um, I think there's like a little playground that needs some maintenance, but it's there. And and when we formed Sister Gardens, the project really came about in 2014. I, that's when I got involved. Per, perhaps there was like earlier history, um, but when neighbors came together and said, we want to make use of this space, this place that um, sometimes can be considered blighted, trash dumping, um, graffiti, a lot of issues, right? Um, how can we make use of this space uh, and work with the city to um, create, to realize our vision? And so um, there, yeah, so when there was a series of meetings that I, and I really, that was when I got involved in our organization. We don't typically run gardens. Um, I think we're, we often do advocacy, we're at City Hall, we're pushing around, pushing for policies, things like that. Um, but when there was a call to action, um, we wanted to support and especially provide the in-language access, be able to do interpretation, uh, door knock the neighborhood, uh, to ask people to engage in this process of visioning for Sister Gardens. So I think there was a series of public design meetings, um, which kind of helped shape the final design. So here's some pictures of like um, us at the IT Bookman Center, which is one block away, a really important community center uh, for the neighborhood of Ocean View, Merced, Ingleside, or in my neighborhood. And um, there we go. And I also want to really uplift the leadership of the neighborhood and the leadership of the youth. So through CPA, through my organization, we have a youth leadership program every summer. And the focus is on 
letting people learn about environmental justice and taking leadership. And so one summer when we were forming Sister Gardens, we were like, okay, the youth can go and help survey, talk to neighbors. And so the young people surveyed, I think over a hundred members and invited them to come activate the space. So the grounds here, um, this is prior to Sisterhood Gardens being built. So it's very barren. There are beautiful trees. Um, and yeah, over time, um, the youth continue to come back, uh, even when they graduate, to come back to uh, attend different volunteer build days to build out different aspects of the garden. Uh, we also formed a, a steering committee of neighbors who really helped design, uh, like after the landscape design was finalized, we needed to figure out how do we shape our membership? Uh, what are the rules of the garden, right? Uh, how do we make decisions? And so the steering committee formed and uh, has many of them have been around ever since. So we have currently a steering committee of 10 people. Now our garden is much established. I think in the initial years, we were very focused on construction and that was very stressful and challenging and brought conflict between people about how to do things, how to build. Uh, but we have had the privilege of now being very established and have the time to like think a lot about how to strengthen neighborhood relations, how to partner with other organizations, bring different education, uh, opportunities in the neighborhood. So our garden is year round. We do have a membership base. The neighborhood was very uh, emphasized the need for plots um, in the design. So a huge part of our garden is plot base. We have uh, 43 families who have plots uh, that they grow uh, culturally relevant, fresh food. Um, and this is especially important because the neighborhood has been ID'd as a place where there's a lot of food insecurity. We now have H Mark down the block, but prior to that, a lot of people had to drive. And H Mark is pretty expensive. I don't know if you all have, are fans of H Mark, um, but yeah. So, so food insecurity is still an issue, and it's been a joy for a lot of our garden members to grow fresh food and share with each other. Beyond that, we also have community uh, communal collective garden areas. So this really requires both our members and volunteers and neighbors to come every month to help steward and maintain. So we have like our, we have a common a communal box that we call like the veggie herb box. Um, we have fruit orchard area, pollinator garden, California native habitat zones, cut flower row. Um, if you've been to our garden in the last few years, our cut flower row has really expanded a lot. Um, and we are very known for our dahlias. And we have many uh, very unique varieties of dahlias there. And um, Tim, our garden ma manager, actually, I think won an award for a certain type of dahlia. Um, let's see, what else? And I wanted to share that, yeah, I think um, what's really important about Sister Gardens in terms of environmental justice is that it is a victory um, and that it really requires um, the community to take part in uh, finding the solution, right? Uh, and since uh, Sister Gardens, we've, we've, we call ourselves Sister Gardens because we have aspirations to continue growing. Um, and one of the ways where we've been growing on Brotherhood Way is also to steward Ramsell Street Stair. So it's a little outside of our garden. Uh, we've taken responsibility to plant a dry garden. Uh, we are also through a community challenge grant able to create a mosaic mural. Um, and we were able to engage the community in, in, in designing uh, this mural. So I think we had a series of surveys to and meetings to talk about what kind of art, how do we want to visibilize our neighborhood and the garden? Uh, what are we proud of in the Ocean View Merced Ingleside neighborhood? Uh, so this is kind of the project, our latest project that we've been working on. Um, and we're pretty much ready to install. We're just waiting on this permit that's been delayed for a few years. Um, so this is kind of the, what the, the mosaic looks pieced together and we just need to glue it on the stairs right here. Okay, and I, Call to action, I think um, 
would love to uh, have see you all at the garden. We have regular volunteer days. We have amazing community events, workshops that are led by our neighbors on a variety of things like traditional Chinese medicine medicine, natural dye workshops, all kinds of stuff, things that people, skills that people want to share and with each other. Um, and I think, you know, we're also in the process of advocating for a budget. So next year, if you all want to support by writing letters of letters to say that you visited the garden and you want it to continue being uh, fully funded, we'd we'll, we'll love to invite you to join in that process. And that's it. Thank you, Tiffany, and thank you to all our panelists today. I know we are short in time, but now we'll move on to some Q&A. I do see we have a few questions in the chat. I do want to give the floor to folks who are asking these questions. So, McClee, I'm not sure if you'd want to unmute yourself and go ahead and ask your question, and we can kind of move along in that direction. Sounds good. Thank you, Yuvia. My question is for all the panelists, what role does multiracial solidarity play in advancing environmental justice? I'm happy to start. Thanks for your question. Um, <clears throat> I think when we were doing our years of outreach, it was clear early on that the community-based organizations and residents really appreciated talking about these issues citywide because while the framework is like the first citywide policy, there have been like many EJ efforts like project by project or department department, maybe like one neighborhood, one issue, what have you. And so our outreach like gave people to just like take a breath you know, go a little bit step back and say like for our whole city, where are our areas with like disproportionate EJ and how do we come together? And so we were able to have folks from CPA, um, CBOs in the Mission, in the Bayview, Tenderloin, Biz Valley, you know, everywhere. Um, and really had like a collaboration space like with particular emphasis on like community leadership. And so I think they were able to um, speak clearly about, you know, even though certain like racial and ethnic groups experience EJ differently, there are a lot of like shared solutions that people want. And so um, I think it was like a strong thread of um, like tribal consultation. There was a strong thread of like um, bringing these issues to like ESL communities, um, what have you. So uh, it was definitely a big theme, still a big thing to keep on working on, but that's at least my gut reaction in this moment. Thank you, Danielle. And someone in the chat asked, what is a dry garden? So I'm not sure if Tiffany or who can answer that, Danielle or everyone, no? Um, I think it's like garden that requires less water. So uh, succulents, cacti. Mm -hmm. Thank you. Julie, I'm not sure if you'd like to get off mute and ask your question. Hi, everyone. Yes, thanks so much um, to the speakers um, and our hosts for this great event. This is um, wonderful. Uh, I, I just have a question, a few questions for Danielle about the environmental justice communities map. Um, it looks like she did answer one of them. I was asking um, if there was a link to the environmental justice map just so that folks can reference it for our own research and our work. Um, and my other question was just to clarify, uh, is the map, the environmental justice map, is that a combination of all of the data sets um, pertaining to environmental justice? Um, you probably mentioned this already, but is it like a combination of the air quality data, the pollution, the tree canopy, and other health data um, that you all looked at. Uh... Yeah, thanks, Julie. Um, so the EJ communities map, we picked basically four layers to represent EJ. 
And through GIS, we used a raster analysis to identify the areas with most concentrated EJ and social vulnerability. We reviewed over 100 data sets, and there were just like some technicalities of what data sets are robust, which ones are constantly updated. And we totally recognized that we couldn't exp like demonstrate all um, types of EJ in our map. So as an example, it's hard to find robust data with like subpar housing conditions. Like where are air conditioners or where are folks having like poor, um, you know, access to X, Y, Z. So we did do our best and captured all the other data um, into a uh, story map for people to click through, just as more information to supplement the core map. Uh, your next question was about how often it's updated. We intentionally made it a little bit um, simple so that it doesn't rapidly get outdated. And so we don't have like a regular cadence to update it. It's really just whenever any of those four layers get updated themselves. So Calenvira screen, APES, household income, as well as areas of vulnerability. And because it um, was just launched last January, we kind of just wanted it to settle a little bit. Um, the five-year estimates from the census did update while we were creating our map. So we just have that planned, like a batched update. And um, for people who want to know more about the map, I'm happy to share our technical documentation or set up time to, you know, like build that capacity because we did work with like our own cartography team to, to get it up and running. Mm -hmm. yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Danielle. And I think just one more question before we kind of wrap things up. This one's for John. How can public work staff get involved in the street tree nursery? Yes, well, that's a great question. And we would love more involvement. I will say that although we had a ribbon cutting, ribbon cutting does not mean a normal completion of construction. So we are still wrapping up a few things at the site, but we hope to be kind of fully operational in about a month. Um, but I think a couple of ways people can get involved. We're going to definitely be starting with efforts to be planting out the site. We want to add as much greenery to the space as possible. So we could probably coordinate. It might be helpful to know that there's interest. If there's interest, we could coordinate some volunteer times for our staff to assist us with that. That would be great. And then another thing, it would be great to get any help activating the site. If you are interested in maybe even holding a meeting there or have ideas for events, or things like please reach out to us and uh, it's a great place that you know, can host groups of people so that would be another way of people can get involved and be on the site. Uh, thanks, everyone. This is Beth again. Um, we've got about five minutes left um, and I'd see more questions coming in. I, I want to just give a huge thanks to our incredible um, panelists. I, I think it's like I'm, everyone is, there's so much great information. So thank you so much, Danielle, John, um, and Tiffany. Can we give them a round of applause, like maybe unmute or just like, um, just like we've got a, like 130, 40 people on. We're just so grateful. I see a lot of virtual support applause. Thank you all so much. Um, and I also want to just thank our racial equity team, um, UVN McLeet and Julie's on our racial equity working group. And so is John and I put a list of all of 12 of us. Um, so please reach out and many thanks to Clint for being our Zoom um, caretaker. Please take our 30 second survey. It's probably less than 30 seconds. Just click on that link I put in the chat. We really want to hear from you if you like this programming, if you want to hear uh, what other topics you want to hear about. And so for our closing, um, maybe a minute each from our panelists. Um, what's a, like, what's a call to action? And if, or like, why do you keep doing this work? It's so deep and rich. And I want to start with Tiffany. I, um, I think uh, one thing is, uh, co-governance. I think it's really important to strengthen how 
uh, pu public and community relationships. Um, right now in this moment, there's often a lot of distrusting, distrust in government. Um, so in order to do that, really bringing, inviting impacted people to be part of the conversation, to be cons consulted in the decision-making earlier on, not when things are very established, um, more touch points with the community. So I think that's a call to action, especially for you all who work in uh, public works. Um, yeah. Also, I just want to give a quick shout out to Beth, who was a really critical part of building Sister Gardens and establishing and even inviting me, a CPA, to be part of the process. Okay. Thanks. Thanks, Tiffany. Um, let's see, John, and then Danielle. Well, the first answer was I really don't know what else that we do, but the second answer is I think it's our it's our birthright to um, be able to be connected to nature and live in a healthy environment. So I think it just comes along to for any work with, to promote the island uh, is something I think is my purpose. Um, I think there's many reasons why I'm compelled to do this work, but I think the first is the people. Um, it's very easy to be a technocrat and talk about policies and the adoptions process and getting to commission, but really it's about connecting with the communities, talking honestly and openly about you know people's lived experiences and really honoring that truth and trauma of people's um, lives and really trying to be creative and relentless about improving government for San Francisco. And so, yes, I'm proud of the EJ framework, but that's like a drop. We need to keep on going. Um, more people need to be on board. And so I think just thinking through the baby steps of the environmental harm that's been done is a kind of big, big target for, for us to focus on. We, we send you all just tons of love and thank you for your incredibly inspiring work and that you took time out of your very busy days to come and volunteer. Um, there, there are no speaker honorariums here, unfortunately, um, and volunteer to, to share this work with like our amazing team at Public Works. I know we're all really inspired um, and are thinking hard about like, how do we relate this information to what we do, whether we're a landscape architect or a street cleaner, or a budget person. Um, so as we leave, it's one o'clock. If you, it's so great to see people's faces. If you want to just um, like put your video on for a sec and wave uh, to our guests, we love that. So thanks, Scott. Thanks for coming. Thanks, Julie. Nice to meet you, Stephanie. Hey, Latif and Patty, Chris, Third. Christopher and <clears throat> Patrick. Sorry, Clint. I'm just calling out names. <laughs> no, I was going to say there's also a survey on Zoom. It's the same as the. It's the same as the one that you can click on so you can do one or do them all or whatever and my apologies for double, double no 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 I, I create no i created a, another one again so we could capture everyone but it's uh we've got about 24 people participating in the in the zoom one so it'll okay. be great and to we, get the data yeah we'd love to and please please email us at racial equity at sfdpw.org tell us what programs you want to hear what you, you want to see um Hey, Nick and Bayo, and I want to call out Patrick Rivera, who's part of our racial equity team also. Um, just really appreciate you all here during your lunch. Have a great day. Thank you. Thanks, hey, everybody. Hey, June and Thank Kyle. You. Thank you. Bye. Bye. Hey, Rafi. Bye. Bye, thank Bye. you. Bye. Nice to see you. Hey, Natalie. <laughs> yeah, good to see you. Bye. Bye. Now Bye, I see you. everybody. Bye. Have a good one. Thanks for coming. Thanks see you, Corey. Yep. Hey, Beth. Hey, Clint. Looks like everybody dropped off but us. There goes. Hey, Christine. Well, Hi, Greta. I thought we should let it. Yeah. Let everyone. I love it's that. It's great to see that number, 134, 146. I mean, that's great participation. That's really, that's, that's, that makes us feel good. I that was really, I kind of 
brought that question to you in the in the private chat. I don't care if anybody hears me. Um, <laughs> you know, I'm thinking about I'm just thinking about how the push for housing and then the environmental justice, how they how they work together to get the best outcome, right? I mean, because you know that the developers and things that want we need housing, right? We want housing. We also don't want to just put a concrete structure everywhere where there could be trees, right? I mean, it's a complicated issue. I think there's probably really smart people that know yeah, what the I balance and answer is. But I thought that was a very interesting a dilemma. Um, yeah, I agree. I see Bayo can't seem to find us unmute, but it sounds like he wants oh, to say hi. You, you did some magic, but <laughs> oh. yeah, thank you so much for that. <laughs> like, um, somehow there was a, like an outage in my email was affected, so I couldn't log in. I came in like 30 minutes then, but I still learned a lot. Oh, so happy you came. Yeah, it was a great, it was a great presentation. Thanks for uh, setting it up. Yeah. Um, it was really awesome. Thank you, Clint, so much. Like, we're all a little rusty, but I think it went off without the hitch, really. And like, it just was, it was beautiful. Yeah, I think it, I think it worked well. Um, at the end, I know um, Yuvia and McLeet asked to be unspotlighted. And I know some people, it's more sensitive than others about being spotlighted. So apologies to them if, if that bothered them. Um, I do have the poll results downloaded as well. So you can combine them with your oh, compare good. and combine just as a, on yeah. a simple, on a simple uh, survey like that, I can, I just, we can yeah. whip them up live. I know. I, I, I love know, I, I love that. And you know, you said that and like, and I, I was like, I don't actually completely understand. So, <laughs> <laughs> so that's why like, I did it. Um, yeah. So, but like, yeah, it, it's, that's that sounds great. Um, I actually just clicked on the on the the Zoom survey so I can see the results, and I'll just put it. Um, well, I didn't know because people wrote their answers. Yeah, like so I didn't want to put that public, um, just because if yeah, right if they didn't want yeah. <clears throat> if they didn't want their revealed, yeah. but I yeah. did download it so that we can parse it out. Yeah, I think that's great. I mean, I'm just looking at like everybody's just just they yeah, just we said didn't get it. The only thing I hear see somebody saying like as a suggestion is like do it through Teams and not Zoom, but just because it's like more of a one click in house. But um, yeah, I'm gonna go to my next thing. Thank you, hey. I, like super appreciate this. Yeah, okay, it was bye. fabulous. Bye. Bye.